We are gathered tonight because crimes against humanity and human rights abuses are being committed before our very eyes from the Middle East to the Caucasus to Eastern Europe to Asia, Central America and many parts of the world. Tonight we will have an opportunity to hear and learn from distinguished speakers who have been dealing with human rights issues in our times. But first allow me to tell you why this annual lecture is named after Bishop Gregoris Balakian. <coughs> Bishop Balakian was the first survivor to give us a depth of understanding about what happened during the Armenian Genocide in the Ottoman Empire during World War I. Especially in the desert of northern Syria and a region called Derzor, where more than 400,000 Armenians alone perished, the sort of the Auschwitz of the Armenian Genocide. In his book, Armenian Golgotha, Balakian brings together survivor accounts, eyewitness testimony, historical background, context, and analysis. He was born in 1876 in Tokat, a small multicultural city in the north central highlands of Turkey. He studied engineering in Midweiler University in Saxony and later theology at University of Berlin. However, his studies were cut short as he returned to Constantinople when the war broke out in August 1914. On the night of April 24, 1915, he was arrested in Constantinople along with 250 Armenian intellectuals, writers, teachers, clergymen, and cultural leaders, and were deported to a prison in Chandra, some 200 miles to the east. He spent four years in prison Indeed, during the entire period of the, the duration of the war, and then was driven south on a forced march amid continual horrors and extremity. Thanks to his fluency in German, he was able to engage with German engineers and administrators in Turkey at the time, which later proved vital for his disguise ultimate escape. After the armistice, Bishop at the time, Reverend Balakian, an esteemed clergyman and respected community leader, was a member of the Armenian delegation to the Paris Peace Conference. In 1921, he was appointed pastor of the Armenians in Manchester and London and was commissioned by the Catholicos of all Armenians of the Armenian Church to organize a diocese for the Armenians in Europe. He served as the Bishop of Southern France for 10 years and died in 1934 in Marseille. Bishop Balakian called himself, and I quote, shepherd of a dismembered flock, an exiled clergyman in a caravan of exiles. Nearly a century later, His Grace Bishop Pavakim Manukyan, the primate of the Armenian Church in the United Kingdom and Ireland, is the host of this annual lecture once again about the continuing ethnic cleansing of Armenians in the Caucasus. This is but one of his many efforts to draw attention to, to the suffering of people in the region as well as around the world. Since his election in 2015 as the Chief Shepherd of the Armenians in the United Kingdom, he has tirelessly worked towards vitalization of the community and has been actively engaged in ecumenical dialogue and service. He brings a wealth of knowledge and experience as previously he was the head of the 
Department of Ecumenical Relations at the Mother Scene of Holy Richmond. I have the pleasure of inviting Bishop Bobakin, the primate, to uh, share a few thoughts with us. Thank you, Dr. Chinigiri. Your Eminences, Excellencies, my lowest ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ. I am honored and delighted to welcome you to the St. Peter Church for the United World Bishop Grigori Spalakian and our major series. As mentioned, Bishop Spalakian stands as a prominent figure in our history. He was a survivor of the Armenian genocide and an eyewitness and a scribe of numerous crimes perpetrated by a state upon its own citizens. In the days of the Armenian genocide, the world had yet to comprehend the full magnitude of such atrocities. Depends like genocide and ethnic cleansing, which were not yet part of the global lexicon. Today, as we stand at the crossroads of remembrance and foresight, we are reminded that the shadows of the past continue to loom over the present. The recent agonies inflicted upon the native people of Artsakh and Karabakh echo the same patterns of persecution and suffering that our ancestors faced. Despite the passage of a century, the Armenian people's struggle to hold perpetrators accountable remain a painful echo of the bygone injustices. The descendants of the perpetrators of the Armenian genocide continue to act in impunity even today, especially in these days when the world's attention is on the Middle East and the war in Ukraine. They not only cleanse the arts effectively, but have claims over the sovereign territory of Armenia. Turkish President Erdogan stated during the so called victory parade in Baku. The soul of Emir Pasha will be blessed now. Emir was one of the perpetrators of the Armenian genocide in 1915. Likewise, the president of Azerbaijan, in one of his speeches, said that they drove out the Armenians like those. His demonizing and dehumanizing his cause continues to have little consequences in this region. This is why the Bishop Balak and another lecture will address human rights issues in our times, such as the unresolved and ongoing challenges facing Armenians and other oppressed people around the world. It is a testament to our collective resolve to remember the past and actively shape the future where justice prevails over the unity. Our ongoing discussions and debates, especially in the House of Lords last October and previously, and even today, have helped us to increase awareness and extend humanitarian aid to the forcibly displaced people of Arsenal and Nagorno Karabakh. Today, we continue this. I would like to thank all my American friends for helping us, especially during the dark hours of the wars in 2020 and 2022. It is very moving when the Archbishop of Canterbury visited Armenia last October and met the Armenians of Artsakh who had come to Armenia after Azerbaijan ethnically cleansed their ancestor homeland. Dear brothers and sisters, these efforts underscore the urgent need of a global commitment to safeguard human rights and preventing further atrocities. As we observe the solemn period of Great Lent, and some of us will celebrate Palm Sunday this weekend, we are also reminded of the profound biblical message that peace is inseparable from justice, just as Jesus cleansed the temple to restore the sanctity. We are called to cleanse the temples of our hearts and work for better and just societies where racial and other forms of discrimination have no place, and where dictators cannot act with impunity. I am immensely thankful to Lord Dalton, Dr. Tatian, Dr. Lopak, and Dr. Chinigeria for participating in tonight's proceedings. 
that their expertise and dedication are invaluable in guiding our journey towards understanding and action. They are gathering in a symbolized home for lasting peace and justice, honoring Bishop Balakhan's legacy and the unremembering spirit of all peoples who struggle for fight, who struggle and fight for justice and liberties. I would like now also to invite His Eminence Archbishop Nikitas, who is primate of Greek Orthodox Archdiocese here in the United Kingdom, and also he is the president of churches together in England, and also president of the Conference of European Churches. Say it Thank you, Your Eminence. Distinguished people of God, I use that expression so I don't make a mistake or omit anyone. But we're all here in the church in the umbrella of God's grace. And I greet you not only as the Greek Orthodox Archbishop of the United Kingdom, but also as President of the Conference of European Churches, more commonly known as CAC, but also as an individual whose ancestors suffered the consequences of at times first <coughs> and other forms of what we might call today terrorism, ethnic cleansing, slaughter, and on down the line. While this evening there is a question posed to each and every one about international law and if it still matters, I'll ask you another question which might be more important. Does truth still matter? And in order for us to keep what is proper and true, we have to defend truth. That's why Keck and I'm happy to say that His Eminence was with me when we were in Estonia, and there is membership from the community in the Keck board and actively participating. As we struggle to make sure that the shrines, the history, and the truth of Armenia is not forgotten or erased. We know that there are transgressions throughout the world, and we must be responsible parties to defend the truth. Not only the law, but also truth. And as I said upstairs, there should be peace, but there must be a just peace, just as there must be real truth so that history is not lost. Please forgive me as I have to go on to something else. The clergy especially will know the many obligations as to members of parliament. But we are obedient to our constituencies. And I give you my pledge and my word to continue to work with my dear and beloved brother to show you that Greeks and Armenians, British, and Americans, those who come from Syria and Italy and all God's people, whether we're from India or Pakistan or even Bolivia, we should all work together for what is right and proper and true, not as we see it, but as God defines. Thank you very much and may God bless this evening. And now I have the pleasure and the privilege to introduce our speakers and the moderator. I will read the, the brief biography about them and then we will have the, the, the keynote uh, speakers deliver their lecture. Our first speaker tonight, Lord Alton of Liverpool, is a most fitting inaugural speaker of the Bishop Grigoris Balakian annual lecture. As the Tolkien quotation prominently displayed on his website's landing page reads, and I quote, there's some good in this world and it's worth fighting for. Indeed, Lord Alton is a courageous fighter for good in this world. And we thank him for that. 
David Atom is an independent crossbench member of the House of Lords since 1997, when he was made a life peer, and has served for 18 years as a former Liberal Party member of Parliament for the Liverpool constituency and chief, chief uh, whip. He is a member of the House of Lords Select Committee on International Relations and Defence. The long list of legislative initiatives and achievements in Parliament are testimony to his steadfast commitment to critical social issues, human rights, and sanctity of human life around the world. He has been listed as one of the top, the top ten most active peers by BBC. Lord Alton is known for his extensive human rights work. He has spoken in Parliament, moved amendments, and promoted bills on genocide, and chaired hearings and collective evidence detailing the genocide against Syrian and Iraqi Christians, Yazidis, and other minorities. Indeed, in 2021, for speaking up for the plight of Uyghurs, and the destruction of democracy in Hong Kong, he was sanctioned, sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party along with six parliamentarians. He is the author of several books and many reports on human rights and is a visiting professor at Liverpool Hope University. In the meantime, he serves as chair, patron, or trustee of several charities and voluntary organizations. Our second speaker tonight is another tireless activist and advocate of human rights. Dr. Arman Tatoyan is a professor of law at the American University of Armenia and chair of the Human Rights and Social Justice Program. In 2016, he was elected by the Armenian Parliament as the country's human rights defender or ombudsman the position he held for six years during one of the most faithful and challenging periods in the recent history of Armenia. He has held a number of high positions in legal profession and international law, including as an ad hoc judge in the European Court of Human Rights, Deputy Minister of Justice of Armenia, Deputy, Deputy Representative of, of, of Armenia, before the European Court of Human Rights and other international legal advisory positions such as for the Council of Europe and the United Nations. Dr. Tatoyan has extensive knowledge and experience in the Constitutional Court and the Cassation Court of Armenia as well as in civil society and international organizations. Like you know, uh, Grigoris Balakian, Dr. Tatoyan is a witness of modern atrocities and crimes against humanity and has been a tireless advocate of the rights of the Karabakh Armenians, especially after they have been ethnically cleansed from their ancestral homeland. After we hear our two speakers and their presentations, Dr. Elena Ocha will be moderating the discussion with the speakers, and we are delighted to have her with us as part of this evening's program. Dr. Ocha is an experienced lawyer, human rights advocate, and author. She is a program lawyer with the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute and is co-founder of the Coalition for Genocide Response. She works on the topic of genocide with particular focus on the persecution of ethnic and religious minorities around the world, as well as conflict-related sexual violence and the situation of children in conflict. She has been raising the issue of abductions and illegal adoptions of Ukrainian children in Russia after Putin's war. She has written over 30 reports 
and made presentations for the UN Human Rights Council, the UN Forum on, the Forum on Minority Issues, PACE, and other international and regional forums. And now I have the pleasure to invite our first speaker, Lord Alton of Liverpool, to deliver his message. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Bishop Vivarkin Maniukin has set me quite a task in inviting me to deliver the first lecture named for Archbishop Gregorius Salakian. And in turn, I doubt that I will do justice to either the subject matter, ethnic cleansing, does international law still matter, or to that illustrious and holy man after whom the lecture is named. I should say in parenthesis at the beginning that I agree with what his eminence said before about how truth precedes everything else that we do. The great Englishman, Ben Johnson, who said, stand for truth, it's enough. Stand for truth, it's enough. Now, as we heard from Dr. Uh, Chilingrian, uh, Archbishop Balakian's own story is, of course, rooted in the Armenian genocide of which he was a survivor. In 1915, in Constantinople, he was arrested with 250 other leading Armenians who were forced onto that death march into the Syrian desert. On learning from one of his captors of the Ottoman government's plan to exterminate the whole Armenian population, Balakian took part in a hair-raising escape and was just one of the 16 who survived. And we've heard more of his story this evening. But it's a testimony that you left us that I want to mention because this set speaks directly into the importance of retaining and gaining evidence about the kinds of events that we're going to discuss this evening. His memoir, Armenian Golgotha, is a crucial first-hand account of the horrific genocide which occurred and it's a rebuke to those who so easily indulge themselves in amnesia or forget or fail to keep records or witness statements. When we fail to remember, we're doomed to repeat the same atrocities all over again. Every bad thing which happens in the world, and there's no shortage of those at this present time, those bad things start with forgetting the bad things that happened before. So tonight I want to divide my remarks into first recalling the Armenian Genocide and why I believe that what is happening in Nagorno-Karabakh is an extension of those events which began in 1915 and which were themselves prefigured by atrocities to which the world had already turned a blind eye. I want to then say something about the use of the phrase ethnic cleansing, about definitions and international law and I want to touch on just one or two of the other situations involving ethnic cleansing in the world today. Now, Archbishop Balakian, as we heard, spent some of his life in Manchester. Well, there's a great rivalry between my own city of Liverpool <laughs> and Manchester. It doesn't just come from football teams either. There's an old saying, a Manchester man and a Liverpool gentleman. And there is quite a rivalry to the, between those two cities. So, if the audience doesn't mind too much, I want to begin my remarks about the Armenian Genocide in the city of Liverpool. On the 24th of September, 1896, at the age of 86, and having been elected Prime Minister four times, William Ewart Gladstone returned to the city of Liverpool to give his last public speech. To the thousands who gathered to hear him at a place called Hengler's Circus, which was in a Liverpool neighbourhood where, 80 years later, I would be Member of Parliament. Gladstone said they might wonder what had brought an old man out of his quiet retirement at Harden Castle in North Wales. And then he provided the answer. Two Armenian gentlemen. In 1876, Gladstone had published his Bulgarian horrors and the question of the East. In a tirade against the tyranny of the Ottoman Turks, in the Balkans, Gladstone used all his powers of rhetoric. This is what he said. Let the Turks now carry away their abuses in the only possible manner, namely by carrying off themselves from the province that they have desolated and profaned. This is the only reparation we can make to those heaps and heaps of dead, the violated purity alike of matron and of maiden and of child to the civilization which has been affronted and shamed 
to the laws of God, or if you like, of Allah, to the moral sense of mankind at large, that such things could be done once is a damning disgrace to the portion of our race which did them, and the door should be left open to their ever so barely possible repetition should spread that shame over the world. Of course, repetition of those atrocities is precisely what did happen. Gladstone turned his moral indignation into a nationwide clarion call. It was called the Midlovian Campaign. It called on civilised nations to stand together for Britain to assert a doctrine of equal rights of all nations, and in particular for Britain to condemn the brutality of the Ottoman Empire against its Christian subjects and to defend their right to believe and to worship freely. After the Second World War, we would incorporate that thought into Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the right of everyone to believe or not to believe or to change their belief. But that Hengler's Circus speech came after a series of pogroms throughout Turkey's Armenian provinces and even in the capital, Istanbul. The Armenians and other Christian minorities were forced to pay double taxes, it still happens in parts of the world today, and were denied many civil rights. Their protests against that discrimination led to their wholesale slaughter. At Harden, Gladstone had carefully taken first-hand accounts from those two Armenian gentlemen. And he began his remarks that day in Liverpool by saying, the powers of language hardly suffice to describe what's been and is being done. And exaggeration, if ever we were so disposed to it, is such a case really beyond our power. He declared, we're not dealing with a common and ordinary question of abuses of government. We're dealing with something that goes far deeper. Four awful words. Plunder, murder, rape and torture. In describing his words, the horribly accumulated outrages, he demanded that a non-sectarian and non-partisan approach be emphasised, and he said that, quote, this is not a crusade against Mohammedanism, that whatever faith had been held by the Armenians, it would have been incumbent upon us with the same force and the same sacredness to speak out on their behalf. And with precision, Glaston identified and named the Ottoman Turkish Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, the assassins, as he called them, as responsible for the order to massacre the Armenians, and he roundly condemned the European powers for giving the Sultan, quotes, the assurance of impunity. While believing that ideally Europe should act together, he bitterly criticised their failure to do so. Remember this in the context of what I will say later. He said, collectively, the powers have undergone miserable disgrace. But when Europe failed to act, Gladstone said Britain had the right to act alone and not, quotes, to make herself a slave to be dragged at the chariot wheel of other powers in Europe. A German newspaper, the Hamburger Nachrichten, took Mr. Gladstone to task. And this is what that newspaper said. For us Germans, the sound bones of a single Pomeranian, German, Grenadier are worth more than the lives of 10,000 Armenians. Many of these same arguments have relevance and application in our own times, but so does the challenge which comes at the culmination of his Hengler's Circus address, when he demands no ambiguity, no neutrality, the condemnation against crimes of humanity. Quotes which have already come to such a magnitude and to such a depth of atrocity that they constitute the most terrible, most monstrous series of proceedings that have ever been recorded in the dismal and deplorable history of human crime. That he was able to take that record that he'd heard from those two Armenian gentlemen and to put it into those words is again a lesson for us, particularly in what will be an important political year, an election year. Unless you go and tell the story and bend the ears of politicians, then that message will not go outside of the community. It's important that you take it to others and get them to articulate it. Gladstone, all those years ago, was right to prophesy that indifference and ignorance would lead to catastrophic consequences. And we'll see the same response and the same consequences in other examples that I'll cite later. 
But he told his audience in, remember, 1896, that if they were indifferent when people in faraway provinces were slaughtered, it would only be a matter of time before the same horrors were visited upon them. For 17 years after Gladstone's death, the Armenian Genocide of 1915 would become the second genocide of the 20th century after the Herero and Nama genocides. But over one million men, women and children were killed as the Ottoman Turks sought to entirely erase the Armenian identity from Eastern Turkey. 1.5 million ethnic Armenians arrested, deported or murdered by the Ottoman Empire. Jeffrey Robertson KC in his Was There an Armenian Genocide concluded this. The evidence, he said, is compelling. The deliberate fanning of racial superiority theories in the Turkification program, the deportation orders and the foresight of the consequences, their failure to protect the deportees or to punish their attackers, some of whom were state agents. They instigated, or at the very least acquiesced in, the killing or a significant part of the Armenian race, probably about half of those who were alive in eastern Turkey at the beginning of 1915. If the same events occurred today, he said, in a country with a history similar to Turkey's in 1915, there can be no doubt that prosecutions for genocide would be warranted and indeed required by the 1914 Genocide Convention. Well, in the 1950s, as a child, my dying grandfather gave me pictures of Armenians which he'd collected during the capture of Jerusalem, where he served as a soldier with General Ed Edmund Allenby's Egyptian Expeditionary Force. The pictures were of Armenians executed by the Ottoman Turks during their retreat after the capture of Jerusalem. And I would see the same pictures again in 2007 when with my daughter Mary Ann and my parliamentary colleague and friend the great Baroness Caroline Cox who sends her greetings to you tonight. She has to be in Oxford but I travelled at that time with both of them to Armenia and to Nagorno-Karabakh. In Yerevan we took the opportunity to visit the memorial to the genocide victims and to spend time at the Genocide Museum. The museum had collated the memories, the photographs and the records into a damning indictment of both the objectives of the Ottoman Turks and the abject failure of the international community to act on the information which its own diplomats had assembled and which in an overwhelming number of countries still to this day, including the United Kingdom, not been recognised as a genocide. To this day, in pandering to Erdogan rather than upholding the truth and seeking the healing of history, the UK's Foreign Office defends Turkey as a potential ally, quote, in the fight against terror, as a, quote, NATO ally and as a post-Brexit target trading partner. Although the US has often taken much the same position as the UK, at least in 2019, the U US House of Representatives decided that truth, which we heard about at the outset this evening, the truth mattered more. Anna issued a Democrat Congresswoman from California, the only Armenian Assyrian member of Congress said this, I've been waiting for this moment since I first came to Congress 27 years ago. Members of my own family were among those murdered and my parents fled with my grandparents to America. What all the persecuted had in common was that they were Christians. So the evidence is there to see. The impunity is horrible. Amnesia about the deadly phenomenon of deportations, concentration camps, rape and killings and ethnic cleansing didn't end in 1915 with the Ottomans. Hitler simply believed that people's indifference would enable him to murder with impunity as he began his campaign of Jewish annihilation. I'm told there's an old Armenian saying echoed in Mosaddaq that to be an Armenian is an impossibility, a saying which had equal applicability to the Jews of Hitler's Germany. That impossibility of being able to be who you are is a wretched experience shared today by minorities the world over. My good friend, the late wonderful Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, in his book, The Dignity of Difference, <coughs> celebrates difference in our society. Even today, there are Armenians living in their homeland and in the enclave of the Gona Karadak that face the ever present danger of constant unspeakable acts, motivated by that same hatred 
which ignited the genocide of 1915. I've seen its consequences firsthand in the declining remnants of Christian communities in southeast Turkey, which I visited, in Kurdish refugee camps of northern Iraq, which I visited, or the Yazidi Holy Mountain in northern Iraq at Sinjar, which I visited. Early against Turkish nationalism and Islamist extremism is illustrated by his gratuitous decision to turn Istanbul's Hagia Sophia into a mosque, and indicative of his unwillingness to live with difference or to respect one another's traditions or history. The Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem, Theophilus III, was right to recall that in previous epochs of history, the seizure or destruction of one another's sacred places and holy sites has led to centuries of bitterness and hostility. He rightly said, our experience in Jerusalem is that to attempt to treat contested holy sites in an exclusive manner is simply a recipe for bitterness and suffering. When our holy sites are open to all, there is peace and mutual respect. Turkey is a country with great potential to show the world the benefits of our common humanity and our common human destiny. The Orthodox world appeals to the Turkish government. We urge Turkey to live up to that potential and show the world the value of coexistence between its various communities. Erdogan's agenda, though, is a very different one. He sees himself as heir to the Ottoman Empire and staged the re-ending of Hagia Sophia to take place on the anniversary of the capture of Constantinople by Mehmet II, celebrating it as an act of conquest. This sequestration and usurping of buildings and artifacts is done with clinical precision and a purpose. It's to create a fiction instead of truth. It creates a lie that these people no longer exist, that they're not a person, and that no one really cares very much. And as he emboldens his allies in Azerbaijan and takes advantage of the decline of Russian influence, it's self-evident that not only has he encouraged the hostilities and ethnic cleansing of the caravan but his pan-Turkic dream of completing the work of the Ottomans and eliminating Armenia itself is as potent and dangerous now as it was in 1915. In September 2023, Azerbaijan provoked a massive military attack on the Gorda Karabakh, Arsak, which has its origins as part of the 10th province of the Kingdom of Armenia, existing from around 189 BC to 387 AD, and in three decades of contemporary de facto independence. There have been two wars, of course, over the enclave in 1994 and 2020, the so-called 44-day war. After the first war, five de facto states came into existence, following civil wars which began at the end of the Soviet era. And they, of course, all had their origins in Stalin's mass displacements. Kazia, Chechnya, South Ossetia, Transnistria, and North Carolina. There was internal sovereignty, but no external recognition, or for that matter, international legitimacy. And unresolved issues simply stored up trouble for the future. Azeri refugees were decanted to camps, in Azerbaijan, I visited both those camps and wrote at the time that no real attempt was being made to permanently resettle them or to find a long-term solution, and that this was being used, these people were being used, and they would come back to fight again. And it did in 2023. That attack following the deliberate attempt by Azerbaijan to starve the people into submission via the blockade of the Latin Corridor, about which I regularly raise questions in the United Kingdom Parliament, has led to the mass exodus of 100,000 Armenians driven from their ancient homeland. As the European Parliament and the US administration have made clear, this gross displacement not only has huge humanitarian consequences, but has implications for identity, self-determination, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. And there's a read across from that to Ukraine, to Taiwan, to Guyana, to Portland, and elsewhere. The resolution of some of these questions is not helped by hazy definitions and little international agreement about which principle takes precedence. Ethnic cleansing as a phrase has no formal definition. It's not recognized as a separate crime in international law. United Commission of Ex Commission, UN Commission of Experts which examined what happened in the former Yugoslavia, 
simply said that ethnic cleansing could be regarded as a contributor to war crimes and could fall within the terms of the Geneva Convention. But note the ambiguity and the lack of force. And beyond the legal remedies, the resolution is also hindered by the lack of emphasis placed by political and religious leaders in shaping discourse about how different ethnic and religious groups can take practical steps, reinforced by legal settlement, recognizing the rights of ethnic and religious communities and the objective of creating shared space, shared space and mutual respect and coexistence. From time to time, Azerbaijan has spoken such words, but its deeds do not. Indeed, the drumbeat was never silenced. And along with the bunkers, the landmines, and the great made drones, and Turkish state of the art weapons, along with the caricatures and the offensive stigmatization of its Armenian neighbors, the aggressive intentions of the coup were never far below the surface. The signs of international crime have been speaking their names for decades. Recall that ethnic Armenians are banned from entering Azerbaijan. Children in Azeri schools are taught that all Armenians are enemies. The Azeri president, Aliyev, and his officials make fierce, offensive, deeply racist statements about Armenians, describing them with her, some as dogs, and calling for the decontamination of the Gorbachev Karabakh. But those who kill Armenians abroad, like Ramal Safarov, are rewarded by the state. At the back of the trophy park, children have been taken to see grotesque, offensive, offensive mannequins of Armenian soldiers with exaggerated features and exhibited in humiliating poses. But which countries have protested about this? Who contradicted Aliyev when he described, I quote, Armenia as a country is of no value. It's actually a colony, an outpost run from abroad, a territory artificially created on ancient Azerbaijani land, tweeting that Turkey and Azerbaijan work in a coordinated manner to dispel the myth of Armenian genocide in the world. Armenia is not even a colony, it's not even worthy of being a servant. We are driving them away like dogs. While the stigmatizing propaganda doesn't end there, all of Armenia is increasingly referred to as Western Azerbaijan. To accompany that fiction and to airbrush out of existence Armenian heritage and culture, with academics in Azerbaijan renaming Armenians as Caucasian Albanian. Its intentions in the Karabakh can be seen in the eradication of all Armenian cultural and religious heritage in the enclave of Nakhichivir and in the use of sledgehammers to destroy the cemetery of Julfa, which contained thousands of stunning, beautifully carved, 1,000-year-old Armenian uh, Kachkars. In an act of desecration, a shooting ground has been erected over the cemetery, with access denied to UNESCO and outside observers. And friends, there was deafening silence from the international community after the 2020 war, during the endless persecution which followed, and in the aftermath of the 2023 ethnic cleansing. And Azerbaijan's is by no means finished. As we heard in Parliament only last night, my friend Tim Lawton chairs the all-party parliamentary group on Armenia. And he was telling me of evidence given again only last night in Parliament. 31 Armenian villages, excluding enclaves, are currently occupied by Azerbaijan, which is making illegal territorial claims to them. Mr. Aliyev says, quotes, this is our land. We are on our land. Lake Garagol, Lake Sebas, and other places are ours. We are here now. Close quotes. Azerbaijan is seeking to cut road links from Armenia to Georgia and Iran, all part of a process of asphyxiation. In September 2023, following the starvation and bombardment of the Gona Karabakh, Azerbaijan reopened the Latin Corridor. And grabbing whatever they could, People were forced to flee, some being struck by gunfire and shrapnel. As they fled to Armenia, they had to abandon their homes, their churches and ancient burial grounds, their museums, their schools, indeed everything which gave them definition as the rightful and indigenous inhabitants of our town. Note too that there are more than 4,000 Armenian historical and cultural monuments under the threat of total destruction and the territory is subjected to historical revisionism. 
Note also that Russian troops, theoretically there to protect Armenians, told the people to leave their villages, that they shouldn't resist, and that they would be free to return. As the people fled, some of the Russian troops stole personal belongings. The reality is that Russia backs Azerbaijan, describing ethnic cleansing as an Azeri anti-terrorist campaign. In true Putinist style, it continues to deny that the deportation of Armenians has even occurred. Confiscated military hardware was sent west to be used against the Ukrainians. Repugnant. On the 10th of October 2023, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe adopted a resolution strongly condemning Azerbaijan's clear disregard for international norms, warning Azerbaijan that, quote, the practice of ethnic cleansing may give rise to individual criminal responsibility under international law. That's the Council of Europe. Although most European countries have acknowledged the plunder of Nagorno-Karabakh as ethnic cleansing, Along with Russia, the UK government still refuses to call it ethnic cleansing. Well, why not, France? Why hasn't it imposed Magnitsky-style sanctions on those responsible? It's high time that it did instead of implying a moral equivalence between Azerbaijan and the Armenians. On the 17th of November 2023, the International Court of Justice set out the rights of the people who had been forced to flee. But as of this month, no nagorno karabakh Armenians have been allowed by Azerbaijan to return to their homes, and no measures have been proposed by Azerbaijan to enable this to happen. And without the presence of international peacekeepers, who in any event would feel safe to return. Listen to this. On the 7th of August 2023, a good man, Louis Marino Acampo, who was the first chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, he produced a report on nagorno karabakh he said that what had occurred revealed a disturbing pattern of human rights violations, ethnic cleansing and disregard for international law on the part of Azerbaijan towards the ethnic Armenian population. And in a further report, he says he believes that Azerbaijan's treatment of the Armenian population constitutes a genocide, citing Article 2B of the 1948 Convention. And he has given evidence to the effect to that effect, both to the US Senate's Foreign Relations Committee and indeed to the European Parliament. <coughs> Professor Melanie O'Brien, President of the International Association of Genocide Scholars, says the Latin blockade was the start of a genocide as it was implemented with the aim of, I quote her, deliberately inflicting conditions of life designed to bring about the physical destruction of the targeted group. And the international lawyer, Priya Pillay, says Azerbaijan's actions constitute the conditions for the war crime of, quote, deportation of, or forcible transfer, or potentially a crime against humanity. The Lemkin Institute, named after Raphael Lemkin, who gave us the word genocide in the English language and saw more than 40 of his own family, of course, murdered by the Nazis. The Lemkin Institute for Genocide Prevention and the organization Genocide Watch have both described the wholesale attack on the population as constituting genocide. Not a slogan, not a word to be used without understanding its full implications. Genocide Watch says, Azerbaijani forces are still attempting to capture new territory. Azerbaijan is using Syrian mercenaries. Azerbaijan's political ally, Turkey, provides air support for Azerbaijani forces, sparking fears that Turkey will resume the Armenian genocide of 19. Genocide Watch also reminds us, I quote, that forced displacement is a crime against humanity. But Azerbaijan's leaders deny the 1915 genocide while, quote, the Azerbaijani government promotes hate speech and encourages violence against Armenians. Incidentally, they also published the 10 warning signs that are indicative of an impending genocide. The clear objective, then, is to eliminate Armenians from the Caucasus, just as the Ottoman Turks did in 1915 in Asia Minor. This is simply a continuation of a slogan of genocide. But without official recognition of this reality, and without recognition of a justiciable crime, how do you ensure enforceability? In trying to find the answer to that question, I've been reading the magnificent East-West Street, by Philippe Sands KC, and which starts its story in Lviv, in Ukraine. It's a deeply moving personal account, which is born in the mass killings of the Holocaust and the Nuremberg Tribunal. 
and Sands unveils the factors that led Raphael Lemkin and, and Hirsch Rutterpacht to bring Nazi war criminals to trial and to forge legal me mechanisms to hold to account those responsible for genocide or crimes against humanity. The phrase ethnic cleansing, as I've said, was not used. Perhaps it's time to rectify that. But Armenia is itself at least one step closer to being able to use the mechanisms that Letterpack and Lemkin left us. Because on the 1st of February of this year, Armenia formally came under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court by signing the Rome Statute. It opens the door to the prosecution of Azeri leaders, including the sort of arrest warrants which that court has already bravely issued against Vladimir Putin. Without the upholding of international law, we will resort to the laws of the jungle to anarchy, and that's why Nagorno Karabakh matters so much. If you're a Hazara facing genocide in Afghanistan, or a Yazidi facing genocide in northern Iraq, a Christian facing genocide in parts of northern Nigeria, a Rohingya <coughs> facing genocide at the hands of the Burmese military, a Darfuri African experiencing at this very moment the second genocide of the 21st century, and atrocities in other places too, from Xinjiang and in China to the Middle East. The rule of law is not merely about theory. Victims don't have that luxury or time to ask why the signatories to the Genocide Convention repeatedly fail in their legally binding duty to prevent, protect and punish, and since Bosnia, to predict by looking for emerging signs of genocide. We shouldn't sign up to such things if we don't take them seriously. If we have no intention of honouring what we signed up to, we should withdraw our signature rather than devaluing a solemn duty. Be clear, what we fail to do, what we pledge to do, carries with it grave consequences when we fail to do it. Consider what happens when a solemn and binding duty is disregarded, when a death warrant can be issued against a whole race, as happened with the Armenians. When outrageous brutality, mutilation and violence are left to fall to country's landscape, when despots can plan the ethnic cleansing or an annihilation of an entire people, that's when law must assert itself. And if you don't want history to repeat itself, you must at least be told truthfully about historical events and the role of your country in those events. The belief that no one really cares is what always encourages the tyrant. So Hitler believed he could invade Poland and do so with impunity. His, violent, his final solution of the Jews was preceded by that statement, who now today speaks of the annihilation of the Armenians. That same rationale, a culture of impunity, led to the industrialized murders of the concentration camps. The folly of forgetting, collective amnesia about what had gone before, led to Hitler's ideology of a purified master race, directly inspired by the biological vision of a purified pan-Turkism based on racial origins and racial superiority. Even Hitler's corruption of medicine and science drew inspiration from the deliberate infecting of Armenians with typhus in a sequence of medical experiments. I'm coming to an end. In 1942, Stefan Zweig, whose books were also burnt by the Nazis, published The World of Yesterday, Memoirs of European. In it, he described how quickly a relatively civilized and humane society and a seemingly permanent golden age can be ruthlessly and swiftly destroyed. That masterful autobiography charts the rise of visceral hatred, how scapegoating and xenophobia, cultivated by populist leaders, can rapidly morph into genocide and culminate in the hecatombs of the extermination camps. A fatal chain of events stretches from the Turkish genocide of the Armenians to Hitler's concentration camps and to the depredations of Stalin's gulags and Mao's cultural revolution from the pestilential nature of persecution, demonization, scapegoating, and hateful prejudice. Despite the overwhelming evidence, just 32 countries currently recognize the crimes to which the Armenian people were subjected to as genocide. And that failure to recognize past genocides and to name them for what they are is not insignificant. Such denialism and associated impunity for the crimes committed inevitably results in further atrocities. But Turkey should take note that despite its threats to countries which recognize the Armenian genocide, 
the issue never goes away and won't do so in Turkey, until Turkey itself truthfully and honestly recognises this chapter it's in its own history for the infamy that it was. Unhealed history can never and should never be suppressed. It's why it's so important that we honour the memory of Archbishop Balakian tonight and in doing so insist anew with men like Raphael Lemkin that international law must stand between us and the alliance of dictators and authoritarians who seek to replace the rule of law based on a world order determined by their hegemony. Yes, international law does matter still. Who remembers the Armenians? We do. We must. We must always speak for people who face this kind of threat of total extermination and obliteration. Thank you for this. of churches and ecumenical organizations. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my dear compatriots. It is, honor, it is an honor for me to be on the same panel today with Dr. Alton of Liverpool, with Dr. Karachi Nigeria, and Evelina Opa. The purpose of this presentation is to present evidence and facts, evidence and facts and evidence of crimes committed against Armenians, crimes that are ethnically motivated, that are based on racism and xenophobia, and are sponsored at the highest level by the government of Azerbaijan. Human rights, have, uh, human rights protection has been always a very challenging issue, and very often politics economy, even for the geopolitical interests, they do hinder human rights protection. Unfortunately, this phenomenon discredits human rights protection, universality of human rights, and eventually justice and punishment. Um, Armenians, uh, in my presentation today, I will present crimes that were committed and are, this is a continuous policy, are still committed against our nation. First of all, these are Armenians of the Northern Ireland. Lord Alton presented already the basics of the hatred policies of Azerbaijan, deeply rooted. And as I made the statement during the ethnic cleansing of Nagorno Karabakh Armenians, Forcing Artsakh people to live under Azerbaijani authority is the same as forcing Jewish people to live under Nazi regime. It is particularly inhumane, morally repugnant, and intellectually bankrupt. It is even disgusting to suggest this, to make this suggestion. Today, I prepared facts and evidence of crimes that were committed not only in Nagorno-Karabakh but also Armenia, independent Republic of Armenia. And this will prove the very important concept that the current policies of Azerbaijan are directed not just against Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh or Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh, but it is against Armenian identity. It is against Armenianism. It has lots of components that prove this concept. This is, these crimes are destruction of cultural heritage, destruction of churches, killings, mass killings, beheadings, mass displacement, dismemberment, mutilations. mutilations. And all of these crimes remain unpunished. You will never find even a single case that would be punished not only by the government of Azerbaijan, because it is hopeless to think that Azerbaijan would ever punish anyone. Azerbaijan only encourages uh, uh, armenophobia and killing Armenians. This is a tool for their political survival. But I'm now referring even to international justice system. Since we're running out of time, let me just make it in my presentation to mention for those uh, who are interested that I don't know about this, this, this Armenia, this is the Republic of Armenia. And now we're referring today to four provinces of Armenia. Province Kerakonis, which is this specific part 
uh, we have incursions in, in, in this part. We have incursions in the province by the floor. And we have incursions here. And we have incursions in the Tunic province. Today, our main presentation also will present facts related to more specifically the two one example because uh, all the other facts are similar, by which I will try to present the situation that we have in the public department. <coughs> now, let me, refer, let me refer to the strategy of Azerbaijan that was committed of ethnic cleansing. Stepanakert. 
and did not allow Mr. Monica, which is the capital city, to coordinate uh, work related humanitarian special uh, in relation to other regions. Even the International Committee of the Red Cross, I contacted the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, on that day, they even uh, said that they are not able to help because themselves, I mean the International Red Cross in Nagorno-Karabakh, were uh, had to deal with uh, trying to find their family members, uh, children, parents. And I will now go to, to this slide. Here it is the same slide, here we have three colors. What well, the blue is the our directions of Azerbaijani attacks. Here we have orange, this is the other ways, uh, the roads uh, that we produce uh, to flee. And the red signs, they uh, show the, the roads that were blocked by Azerbaijan. So the only, so to, to show the level of observation, Azerbaijan started from four sides. And this part is the base, the room. The door, the, the people uh, leave the territory down to Stepanakir and further to Armenia. Azerbaijan really blocked this road and without allowing people to live. And in this region, people were like in a room where the door is closed and people are forced to move from one corner to another, but they, can, they cannot live because the door is blocked, basically. But people did not, not, do not know about this and they have. Uh, survive, they have to live from one territory to another. And all of these villages were in the same situation. By the way, we have facts that from villages where people were not many, did not manage to live, to flee, for example village Getawa, here we had casualties, this is one of the most one of the main uh, points let's say of, of uh, for people to get it. Uh, we have here even a case of uh, abducting people. We have, for example, a 71 year old man, Armenian, who was abducted by the armed forces of Azerbaijan, now in one of the Baku prisons, and one of the Baku prisons, and they incriminated crime of genocide against this 71 year old man. Um, and later, I will try to show that all of these charges and the criminal cases that they launched against Armenians have one purpose to justify Azerbaijani political narratives. That is why all of them are artificial and arbitrary. This is the second region, which is Martini. Here you can see that Martini, they created a circle, a circle of death for people. All of them were in this situation without any possibility to live, to flee. And all these triangles are all Azerbaijani military positions. And our fact finding missions established that they were also artillery, very heavily used by the armed forces of uh, Azerbaijan. And people, of course, they had more complications because there was no fuel, uh, there was no electricity. By the way, they, this time, unfortunately, we have compared to 2020, 44, they were, we have less evidence for 2020. Why? Because there was no electricity and people did not have any. Uh, they did not have charges, they, they did not have charge on them, and they, they were not able uh, to record or to film any or uh, all of these uh, cases of crime. Moreover, uh, since they did not have connection, they could not call each other and find each other. That is why they were in, they, the entire Karapa uh, was in chaos. Moreover, we have cases of casualties among the civilian population because, because of this Problem. People did not know that Azerbaijani armed forces are already in the vicinity of their communities. In many cases, they tried to went out to find a way out from these communities, but they were killed. We have a case, for example, when uh, an elderly couple uh, tried to find their grandson in a neighboring village. They left uh, Stefan again at about 4 p.m. An old man, grandfather of, 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 of a child. Uh, they left uh, for, 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 the, for the village, but um, they were killed by Azerbaijan, and which certifies again that there was no difference. Uh, whether this is military or civilians, they were opening very heavy shootings. This is the third region, Askela. People here were gathering at the airport. Armenians, especially, I think our compatriots, uh, they would remember that uh, during September. 
September 19, 20 military attacks, there were so many people concentrated in the world of Nagorno this was, These were people from the region of Stephanie who were pushed to this direction. Now this is the manager. The manager, you, you may find this white, uh, the line is, the, uh, I identified the, I chose the administrative district of Stephanie administrative borders sorry, of Stephanie uh, Azerbaijan immediately uh, installed the military positions here and surrounded the Manigay. By the way, they immediately uh, took measures to cause humanitarian problems to people and to make them uh, flee these territories uh, as leave these territories as soon as possible. The point is that all of uh, Azerbaijan authorities keep saying that uh, Armenians left Nagorno Karabakh voluntarily, that they are invited to come and to live together. But we have plenty of facts showing that it was all these people were forced to live, otherwise they would have killed by Azerbaijani armed forces. For example, this place is the water filtration system of Stepanakia. And this place was providing, supplying water to the entire Stepanakia. 60% of the population of Nagorno Karabakh at that time was in Stepanakia. They immediately occupied this water filtration system and starting from September 19, to the very end, people did not have drinking water. They just literally had to drink dirty water uh, directly coming from, from, from mountains. Azerbaijan invaded uh, on September 20, immediately the city of Stepanake, here in the region of Kerkajan, Amen Alman and Azerbaijan. And here we also have casualties. There were many cases when people who gathered in the center of Stepanake, when they were already asked or forced to leave, there was already of the so-called humanitarian corridor. People had, uh, many people wanted to go to their houses, to all places, to find, to collect their uh, belongings and to take them, with, uh, to, take them uh, to, to Armenia with them. In many, many cases, people just found Azerbaijani flags on their houses. And of course, can they can not enter these houses, so they had to flee without any belonging without even food. That is why we have about 70 cases, death cases on the road from the market to Armenia that people just died uh, without being without survival. These are the facts of artillery. You can see that all the roads at the same time, this is uh, this includes uh, almost all the regions, were under heavy and artillery shootings. And, uh, and that is why we have, for example, as a result of bombing uh, Salman Group village, we have four uh, cases of uh, children who died in one village because the school village, the village school was bombed, uh, or they were targeted bombing by the Azerbaijan army. And these are some of the photos. Now I will make a presentation. One, I will present one minute video, about one minute video. This is one of the cases where that we could restore uh, how Azeris were carrying out their crimes. You could you will see now here uh, Azerbaijan armed forces uh, shooting in the direction of civilian houses, uh, just in, in an irregular or indiscriminate, indiscriminate manner.
so this was uh, this was one just case, and uh, others they uh, they spread this video themselves. Usually, how they do? They act like uh, Al Qaeda or other terroristic organizations. Usually, when they commit crimes, they film their own videos and they all, and they spread themselves through Azerbaijani government Afghan channels. And there was always a question: Why they do it? They do it on purpose. They know that they will, be, they will be praised only by their society. They know that they will be encouraged by their government. And they know that there will be no punishment. Because in, when committing crimes, killings, beheadings, everything, usually they are in open faces. And they know that there will be no punishment. Although they commit crimes, war crimes. And because these crimes are not separate crimes for one uh, another, but these are elements of a single chain. Because they have a single basis. This is the, the racist policy, hatred policy of the government of Azerbaijan uh, in the, to, to exterminate Armenian identity. Now, I will make our brief, uh, since we are running out of time, I have uh, plenty of uh, evidence to, uh, that I could present, but I will concentrate on again one example related to Armenia. Currently, Azerbaijan has incursions inside Armenia, Republic of Armenia. And Armenian villages, towns, are surrounded by Azerbaijani armed positions. The scenario is more or less the same as it was in Nagorno-Karabakh. Before the ethnic cleansing of Nagorno-Karabakh, all of the villages and towns of Nagorno-Karabakh were isolated and were surrounded by Azerbaijani armed forces. There were numerous shootings, explosions. They were prohibiting people to use pastures, lands, to earn income for their families. There were cases of abduction. People had no drinking water because others were controlling sources of drinking water. So the similar situation we have in Armenia. And that is why, since there was no punishment for the authorities of Azerbaijan for their crimes in Nagorno-Karabakh, Existential threats, now Armenia is facing the same existential threats. And I will make a presentation uh, on the village near Kihan. The occasion to visit last time this village near Kihan was the incident of February 13, when four Armenian uh, soldiers were killed by the Azerbaijani armed forces from the armed, armed positions that are inside Armenia, seven kilometers deep uh, in Armenia. This is the village that we have uh, in Sunni province. I showed a picture on the map. Um, we have reflected and uh, we, we were able, together in cooperation with uh, our experts, friends, to reveal all of these um, armed positions on this map. And the information that is here has a very high level of credibility. Uh, that we, because we made the public presentation and no one was able to deny what we have here, especially from the Azerbaijan side. You can see now the military positions of the uh, Azerbaijan. So this is the border, according to Google Maps, and there are 25 armed positions of Azerbaijan surrounding this small village from Tresa. We have even revealed the military positions of Azerbaijan, four military positions, you can see in red circles, these are positions from which Armenian soldiers were killed because they have snipers there, so it is easy for them to kill all the soldiers. You can see that more than two kilometers there inside Armenia. These are the Azerbaijan armed forces from the border, we could measure it. Now you will see uh, these are civilian houses, the school, uh, the village club under the control of uh, Azerbaijan. The school is from Azerbaijan military position 700 meters away. Children facing Azerbaijan snipers every day. Now this is the water drinking source. People here have no drinking water at all. They drink water from rivers, literally from rivers. They have no access to cemetery. They still have to open a new cemetery to establish. This is the church. Again, they have no access to the church. Now you can see the armed position in the yellow tents of Azerbaijan. And gardens, pastures, everything are under the control of Azerbaijan armed forces. People are not able to use any of these gardens. Consequently, they have no possibility. I'm sorry. But they have no possibility. We can go even now to the slides. They have no possibility to earn income. Only in this small village, only in this small village, 
we have 2,700 hectares of land that are under Azerbaijan occupation. 2,400 hectares of specially protected lands, 100 hectares of forest lands, 130 hectares of common lands. In addition to that, 1,000 hectares became in this small village not possible, unavailable uh, for, for use by this uh, civilian population. Because Azeris have this principle, when they invade some territory, uh, then it becomes not possible even to approach them even up to 500 meters, so one kilometers, because they open shooting fire in the direction of civilians. Recently, when I was in Nekinham village, people told the story. An old man with his grandchild went to one of these, uh, one of these pastures, uh, 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 trying to show explicitly to Azerbaijan armed forces because they know that Azerbaijan armed forces are watching them all the time with the binoculars. Even they watch from uh, uh, what is happening in houses. Uh, so he went. He started to walk uh, in the direction of this pasture. Then Azeris immediately started to open shootings by this not allowing this man to use uh, his uh, his pasture because they, the purpose is to do everything that people leave these territories. Uh, there is one more thing, you can see that all us that these are the lands, and now one more important fact. The nature in Armenia, forests, everything is very extensively being destroyed and ruined by Azerbaijan. You can see now that all these places were forests. Azerbaijan, when they invade the territory of Armenia, they start building roads, they start building bunkers, different constructions, infrastructure, and by this they ruin Armenian uh, environment and nature, and there will be very soon uh, the very high level uh, nature protection related event in, in Azerbaijan. I wonder how they are able to have and to host this event in their country when they destroy uh, the flora and fauna, the nature. Of the, of the Republic uh, of Armenia. There are also all the time mine and mine explosions and uh, shootings uh, in the vicinity of villages. So when Azerbaijan invades any part of Armenia, they immediately start installing mines. Very often you may hear those who are familiar with Azerbaijan policies. Recently they were especially claiming from Armenia so-called mine maps, that as if they exist in nagorno karabakh uh, in exchange of prisons of war, for example, for their for marketing purposes. But no one discusses the fact that these people install their mines in the Republic of Armenia. We have explosions of cattle almost every day. I experienced myself this prayer, this, this case when I was when I was visiting uh, different villages of Armenia. By the way, we have the same problematic situation not only in Elkinan, but also in the Arabic province and in many other villages of Armenia. Now, I'm coming to the end of my I came to the end of my presentation. Let me just say yes. Let me just say one very important thing. Why Azerbaijan would not stop this policy? The, uh, the response or the answer is very simple. Because they would not survive without hatred policies against Armenians. This is they create an external factor of an Armenian as an enemy, and this is the this is source. This has become a source from which they receive their strength, political strength. One more thing. Now, why this policy is dangerous for other countries? Azerbaijan, when they carry out this policies of animosity, they keep this atmosphere of hostile atmosphere between the two nations, right? And they realize it. Now, we have in different countries. Both Armenians and Azerbaijan, Azerbaijanis, including Turks, living together, right? So, which means that since Azerbaijan is controlling, in most cases, all of these groups that live abroad, these are usually criminal, paramilitary, paracriminal, or criminal different groups, they can turn, they can destroy even the stability of, uh, of these countries in a minute. But we have these cases, for example, in France, during the 2020 war, or before the war, Azerbaijani uh, military groups were hunting literally Armenians. Armenians, for example, had to remove crosses from their cars so that they not to become victims of these criminal groups. In San Francisco, that I visited together with my friends, they set on fire the local church. Uh, they uh, fired in the direct, they attacked the local school. Why they did this? 
The purpose, is, again, is, is, is very uh, simple to terrorize the army is there and then coordinate it by the government of Azerbaijan. The same is for, uh, goes for Russia, for example, where we have diaspora, Armenian diaspora there. And I'm sure that this, uh, this phenomenon may, may exist in uh, other countries as well. So this was the end of my presentation. And again, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer.